could look through these, there were a lot of things I just did. Because at this point, I've been writing these for a long time. Um, and uh, they're becoming more organic for me to write. When I first wrote the first four etudes in the first book, I was like, I need to fit this pattern into this tune. And I tried to kind of jam them in there. And it resulted in some extra musical things that I would have never done, which was good in a way, but also kind of clunky in another way. So I've gone back and edited those etudes a little bit, but they're also what they are. And, you know, they have good things about them. But the ones I've been writing recently are more stream of consciousness, consciousness from all of this Bach that I've been putting into the books. Uh, and I think they're a little more natural. So there's a few aspects to look at in this one. I'll just play it first. I'll do my best. I'm getting ready to record the melodies for all of these, so I gotta gotta learn them a little bit more. This one I already wrote a year ago, I think. <laughs> But um, everybody can hear me okay? Is it super loud when I play? Fairly loud? Okay. Just tell me if it's a problem. <laughs> it's a little hard to go back from speaking volume, which is always too soft to playing. Uh, so any, I mean, you've probably heard some obvious uh, licks in there, not just from Bach. So I'm going to go through it line by line and talk about where I'm getting things. So it starts with this. <laughs> So as I'm looking at these, what I'm realizing more, even though I didn't realize it as I was writing them, is I'm really just voice leading chord voicings. And that's what Bach's doing so much of the time. So I might have like, a, in this case, it's in first inversion. <laughs> I can narrow these patterns down to maybe three notes that kind of encapsulate the basic chord voicing that I'm playing within. And within that, there's all this linear stuff that's happening and octave displacements and stuff, but it's still really just voice leading chords into each other. I'm saying this now because I just had this realization. Obviously, it's kind of obvious that we know that but what that's what Bach does. But I was playing through little snippets of all these etudes just before this workshop. I'm like, wow, that's really <laughs> what's happening here. So I don't have this uh, idea fully fleshed out. Um, so I'm going to go back to what I was thinking yesterday, maybe. But um, I point it out now because I'll probably keep pointing it out. It's really about voice leading chords. Uh, and as a monophonic instrument, we're doing that differently than a piano might do it, but similar in a way. So the first pattern is right out of the second book. Jenny might recognize it. It's from the flute partita, which I had up here, but I'm not going to dig to find it right now. It's the same notes. Uh, and that could be looked at in the Bach uh, book, which I've sort of analyzed it here in these new analysis pages. This is ends up being shape number nine. And I have it kind of starting on the third of the chord, which I did here. But then that second half of the measure would be over sort of a B flat. So it's actually a circle of fifths pattern. So the bass line would be. That's the diatonic version. It's just this nice descending circle of fourths pattern, but I'm kind of hearing it here as just a major six chord. If, which if you look at the notes, that's all it is. A, F, C, and D. So it gives you the sixth, which is a beautiful sound. Connecting to the third of the D7. That's my own addition to this pattern, but it's the same thing Bach would have done in a pattern like this that I have up. I'm not sure if I have it up here, but if we go back, I'll show you the book. 
the new book in the sequences chapter. Uh, so this is going to be the fifth chapter of the book, and this is all circle of fifth sequences. On the first page, I've given it uh, chord tone numbers so you can analyze it a little bit and break it down. But the pattern I was looking for was right here, same chord motion. It's just that connecting from third of the E minor to the third of the A minor and with the seventh. So the seventh, the D on the E minor connecting to the third. Bach does all the time. Oh. You know, very classic Bach pattern there. So this is an exciting chapter. We talked about it more last time, uh, but I'll point out when it comes up. Let me blow this up so it's a little easier for you to see. Okay. Um, so here I'm doing the same thing. Seventh uh, of what would be a two chord if this had an A minor before it. Seventh to the third of the D7. Let me play the whole line so you can hear context. <laughs> So something decidedly not Bach in there is that chromatic motion to the augmented fifth of the D7. That's a very like rhythm changes bebop line. Which brings me down to that nice B on the G7. Nice range wise too. This one moves around the horn a lot. And then I go right into another Bach pattern. This is in the book too. That's all. Just connecting um, with sort of a pedal tone aspect. So a lot of these lines, and one of the things that I think you get out of playing Bach is all these pedal tone lines, which is like having an open string on a violin or on a guitar. I keep coming back to it. You know, whatever. So I'm coming back to one note all the time. And that can be displaced by octaves, which I'm not maybe going to try now, but... You know, if you look at the Marcel Mouille books, uh, uh, you know, any of those really technical uh, saxophone A2 books, they'll bring in a lot of that violin style pedal point line. So I bring in that as much as I can in a pretty technically possible way. Um, one of the things I might do if I do a second etude book alone is write some really wide interval open Bach chord voicing type things, but I'm not, uh, as many of you know, I'm more of a musician, I think, than a technical saxophone player, so uh, I'm, I'm not about to write the crazy Altissimo Bach book. I'll leave that up to someone else to write. Um, for me, it's about the lines and the melodic continuity and, you know, recognizing that I'm playing over Indiana. Let's see if that makes any sense. I'm obviously not quoting the melody at all, but it's still clearly navigating through the changes. So let's look at that second line now. Same, uh, different pattern from another shape in the new book. That's pretty much as is. That's pattern number 11 from the new book, from Bach Invention, number 15. Nice little pattern, and it's moving around the circle of fifths again, um, this time with sort of a neighbor tone, third to the fourth. And in this key, in the key of the etude, I've just adapted it to the chord tones. And what I was saying before about voice leading chord shapes, it's really just a G minor 7 up to a C7. Trying to blur the line so you can just kind of hear the character of the chord. And then I'm down to F. F9, I guess, in that case. And then I go back to jazz vocabulary. <coughs> Chromatic approach. And here's another pedal point line. I don't know which 
uh, shape this comes from. I could say that it comes from shape seven, but there's so many Bach lines like this that I may have just done it uh, on the fly. So a lot of those uh, pedal point lines are really nice because they do connect from third to third. In this case, it kind of does that. I voiced it as a B diminished seven versus an E seven, but it's kind of the same thing. So I'm going down, walking down from the D on the B flat to get to that G sharp on the B diminished or which is really sounding like an E seven at this point. And I know that's not proper Indiana changes to go to the sharp four there instead of the four minor, but I liked the way it sounded. It had a very Jerry Mulligan kind of feel to it. And then same pattern, move down. Just the bottom part moves down. So the pedal point stays the same. Obviously not Bach. Now we have sharp nine, flat nine over the D7 going down and connecting again to the thirds. Bach is all thirds and sixths. So is music. So is bebop. Now I'm on the G7. That's the same pattern that I started with right from the A minor flute partita. Now I go right into a bebop line. Bebop scale, if you don't know it, is um, just adding a half step between the one and the flat seven. So G, F sharp, F in this case on a G7. If you just play the bop scale by itself. Now I'm going to do the shape that I wrote here with the sharp 11. But it's not really a sharp 11, it's really just a chromatic approach to the D. Bebop now, so we're out of Bach territory. And that's what's been fun as I write more of these more and more, is that I'm just kind of seamlessly bouncing between the Bach vocabulary and the Bebop vocabulary, and there's a lot of overlap. If any of you have taken Barry Harris's courses or watched his YouTube videos where he's breaking down those sort of diminished um, patterns alternating major six chords and diminished two chords up and down the scale if not do watch some of those but there's a lot of that happening here and it's not because i got it from barry harris as much as that it's just what baroque music does all of the time and what the more kind of baroque oriented bebop phraseology that like bird invented uh does as well there's just tons of bouncing back and forth between the one and the five in creative ways and we'll see that when we get to the minor section of this tune as you know. Um, let me finish this part. No Bach in there, it's really just bebop. And here too, same thing, I'm going to approach the augmented sound. There. So I, I'm getting to that G sharp on a C7, making it augmented briefly. Most of the time, as far as chord symbols go, I try to keep them simple so you'll notice I'm not adding all of these harmonic extensions if I was writing an arrangement for a soli or something I would obviously add that augmented sound in there uh, but for the purposes of this I just kept the chord symbols at their most basic so if you're wondering why there's no augmented on that C7 it's just implied in the line <laughs> chromatic approach to the C and now I'm into another box shape. It's actually that one I played earlier from the sequences chapter. Now, if I go back to the sequences chapter, it's this one up here, E minor, different key. The great shape. I use that all the time. I feel like that made its way into half of the etudes. <laughs> now let me find my tab here. Okay. Uh, da, 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 da. Where are we? Next line. That same bebop shape with the sharp 11. Now I'm getting into the minor section, and this is cool. Um, what tends to happen in extended minor regions like this, where you have sort of a minor tonality for a little while, uh, is you can really just alternate between the one arpeggio, so D minor. <laughs> and the five arpeggio, or maybe better to think of it as seven diminished. 
And then just juxtapose those two things in as many clever ways as you can. So I could just do the arpeggio. Or if you wanted to make it more Barry Harris sounding, uh, which may be a, at times a little more modern than Bach, uh, but he uses the six sound as well. You would add the six. <laughs> you know it brings in that real bebop characteristic so i don't know i do do that here but you'll notice it's over the a7 and you hear that color right away it looks basic but i'll play it and you'll hear it <laughs> I love that B natural there, if you can hear the changes underneath it. Then I bring it back to a B flat, which makes it the flat six as I approach the A. So it's getting both colors. But that B natural is borrowing from, I guess, melodic minor, right? Uh, or the major even putting that B natural, even though I know the chord is A7, but we're really already in D minor. This should be an A7 flat nine, but I didn't put it as such because the melodic line has the B natural. Um, I see that double natural there. I'll have to fix that later. <laughs> Typos that I need to go back and fix. Um, but it's a real color. It sounds basic just to play your melodic minor scale over a D minor, but it really gives it that Dorian melodic minor kind of characteristic. <laughs> And all I'm really doing is alternating D minor arpeggio with a C sharp for color. And then back to A7. Pedal point. And now I'm just approaching the notes of the D minor triad. I really like that line. The next line is taken straight out of Bird. Uh, this is in the book. I It's what Bird plays on Bebop, which is in this key. We've all heard that lick before. And then he goes somewhere else. But what I've done here is borrow something from the book, uh, pattern number eight. It's gonna, No, no, no. I take it back. Not pattern number eight. It's from here, from the Takata and Fugue. So one of the new things in the book, you notice if you have the first book, it has a chapter on uh, bah, 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 bah. basically each key and then there's a couple pages of minor at the end. What I've done in this one is the whole first section is major basically with a couple exceptions. And then I have a whole chapter on diminished and minor uh, type sequences, which involves a lot of what I'm talking about, kind of alternating one to five because uh, that's really what minor is. It's not about learning your harmonic minor scale and your melodic minor scale. It's about hearing the colors of the alternating chords that those things imply. I'm always kind of a chords before scales person, even though I don't play particularly arpeggiated necessarily. I just think that that's where the, a lot of these scales are coming from, is connecting the various chord tones of different chord colors. So here's an example from the Takata. You'll hear the same thing. It's in the same key. <laughs> this measure to transpose it to the next key. So I'll play the whole thing again. minor and it goes around like that it's a really fun uh, exercise to play through and it's just taken from a couple lines of the Takata and Fugue a couple of years ago I played uh, clarinet in an orchestra and we did the was it Stokowski arrangement of the Takata and Fugue and I just noticed so many tough fingering things especially for clarinet I'm looking for it but I can't find it um, 
and so I, I made a point to really pull a lot of things out of that clarinet part and put them into the book. Uh, they weren't obviously originally written for clarinet, but it makes uh, for some really challenging finger and interval stuff. Back to the tune. Wrong key. Okay. So we're in that same pattern. As I get to the G sharp diminished, we're going to use that shape from that toccata. And what's great about that line is it's playing basically a bebop phrase connecting the third. I'm consolidating this G sharp diminished to an E7. I'm doing the Berkeley thing where they just say there are no diminished chords. Everything's a dominant chord. I don't agree with that. But it, it is useful sometimes to think of 7-7 seven, seven, or 7 diminished 7 as being sort of the same as a 5 chord. Um, function wise it's not the same chord because that just meant at berkeley that meant that uh they would never play diminished chords and they'd always want you to turn that into a two five which is you know it's a different attitude <laughs> it's a different thing but diminished color is such a beautiful color i would hate to throw it out all entirely and just say everything's a dominant chord and what that usually led to then was now take this dominant chord and play a crazy half step above substitution on it or something like that. It's a way, of, it's sort of like a stepping stone to taking things out by consolidating it to the dominant chord like that. So I like the diminished color. So usually when I see diminished chords, I play the diminished chord and I might do the scale, the, the octatonic scale as well. But here we go. So that shape, I'll play it down an octave so it's less painful for everyone. It's taking me to that C on the A minor seven, but down from the third of what would be like an E seven up to the flat nine. And now think of us as being in A minor for a second. And that gives us an A harmonic minor scale. I don't really think there is a, a harmonic minor scale in a sense. It's really taken from shapes like this, where you have that G sharp, in this case, the raised seventh, jumping up to the flat sixth. I mean, look at the way Bach uses it. Look at the way all the beboppers use it. It's always used in that kind of iteration. It's not usually, that's a that's an effect, right? Then we're using the scale as an effect. Um, but we do use it so many times uh, where the G sharp jumps somewhere and then you end up using the F just to bring you to the E. The F almost always has to go down to an E something like that so i approach the g sharp from above approach the f from below or with chromatic approach or those are some examples now if i do this sort of shape where it jumps up from the g sharp to the f same thing Now we're starting to sound like Bird. You know, he's playing that shape all the time. It's one of his signature shapes. I'm alternating between a G sharp diminished and an A over and over and just connecting them with some chromaticism, um, some swing kind of push and some um, things that Bach wouldn't have done, though who knows? Everyone argues that maybe Bach's music was much more driving and uh, rhythmic than uh, some performances would lend you to believe. And it being mostly, it's not improvised, but at least, you know, you know they were playing so much more than what was on the page because the page barely has anything. So it's hard to, to know exactly how danceable so much of this Bach was. So the last phrase I want to talk about on this one is the last line. Not to get too deep in the weeds on harmonic stuff, but um, this is that same line. If you did watch the Paul Desmond analysis, he, he uses all the time. Basically every Paul Desmond solo I've learned uh, of a certain era. He didn't do it in the very beginning. It's more from his late 50s on through the 70s. Uh, I don't hear this in the early stuff. You must have discovered in around 1958 or something. Uh, but it's this color of a, in this case, a B triad over a D7. And then it keeps going parallel and does the same thing with an A triad over a C7. I don't know if you can see that. 
pull it up and I'll blow it up. So here, I mean, how I get there isn't as important, but it does usually come up scale wise leading up to that D sharp. So that's the B triad. I'm just playing D sharp, B and F. I'm just extrapolating from what's written. But it's over this. So maybe I can play that in an alternating way. Gets very modern uh, classical music uh, of the 50s. Maybe he's borrowing it from a classical piece. He certainly quotes many classical pieces. Um, but that sound gives you certain tensions. It gives you the D sharp, which is the flat nine. It gives you the 13, which is the B. And it gives you the third of the D7. So it's a really nice shape that gives you a lot of color. And I, at one point, I noticed how much people like Desmond and Stan Getz also really love to play triads that give you certain colors on the chord. So Stan Getz, what he does a lot is, um, say, if he's doing a 2-5 in A on the horn... <laughs> He'll play the half step below, which could be like a diminished color, but he doesn't play it like a diminished color. So and he'll instead of resolving to A, he'll resolve to A flat triad. It delays the resolution and it gives you this really nice color. Listen to any of those Stan Getz records with um, Lou Levy, like the Steamer uh, Award winner, all those late 50s things. And he'll he'll always uh, Woody and You. He does it a billion times on that Woody and You solo. Uh, in that same key, I think, right? <laughs> I got to remember how it goes, but he's resolving to that half step below all the time. So I, I really love triads like that. And it's a little different than the modern way of playing with triads, which I'm maybe going to, if we have time, I'll point out in the next day too, I want to look at. Um, which brings up a whole bunch of other concepts uh, of triad pairs, like that thing of using a dominant chord D and C for a D7. That's cool too, but it's different. This is not really triad pairs. It's just using a triad that's not in that key, but it really gives you this color. And what Desmond does on this whenever he uses it is he almost always pairs it with a 3-6-2-5 kind of shape. So it happens twice, not just once. So it's going up and down and up and down and getting all those colors every time. So this is almost straight out of Desmond. Chromatic to the F. Ending on the ninth. Whew, made it. 